So we are continuing our series in James, and the way we're approaching this is we're just we're entering in with this with this expectation that God's going to speak to us uh, through His Word. What I was trying to say before I got all tripped up on this rug and the other things I needed to do was what was going on in the music is so cool. Like you know, there's moments where you know it, the music helps us connect and unifies us around the same purpose, which in this, in this case on Sunday morning, it's worshiping God. And I think we have a responsibility as we show up here to lean into what God is doing and what he wants to do. And, and the main thing he wants to do is reveal himself to each one of us um, and to speak to us and encourage us, show him himself and, and, and transform us um, into his character. And so that, that's what we're doing this morning. And it's so exciting to, to see that and experience that. And so I just invite you as we get into the Word today to kind of posture your heart, position your heart and your mind to, to ask God, hey, speak to me today. He knows what you're coming in the room with. He knows all the different things in your mind. He knows that some of you are sitting here going, man, I'm giving up two hours when I could be working on this house project that just needs to be done. Or, or whatever it may be. We've all got things in our minds. And so I just encourage you to take this opportunity to ask God uh, to speak to you. Amen? Amen. All right. So let's jump in. Uh, today's theme, we're in James chapter 1, verses 1, 19 through 27. And James covers a lot here. The theme is listening and doing. Listening and and doing, and and I've noticed um, in the church, not just our church, but just kind of church in general. You come across Christians over the years. There's kind of two opposite problems when it comes to listening and doing that I would say are in the church. The first problem is knowledge without action. Knowledge without action, knowing a lot of scripture, being an expert on the scripture but not putting the scripture that you know into practice. And, and the way James says this in the message translation is talking a good game, setting yourself up as a religious person by talking a good game. And so it's talking a good game, but not actually playing a good game. It's being an armchair quarterback. And the problem is that if you study the word, you read the word consistently, you know the word, you talk about the word all the time, but you're not putting emphasis on responding to the word, allowing the word to change your life, putting it into practice. It leads to pride. It can actually turn you into a judgmental person where you're always correcting everybody else, but you're not allowing it to change you. And it stunts your growth because it's easy to mistake knowledge for transformation. And transformation only comes through a putting knowledge into practice. The point of knowing the word is to do the word. And so the, the one problem is knowledge without action. And I'll tell you what, if, if you're on social media, if you're not, God bless you. That's a good choice. It's like you never started drinking coffee, why start? But if you drink coffee, you're like, man, I'm not stopping drinking coffee. And so if you're on social media, you see if, if you, you know, people try to post some encouraging things or post these things they know. And if you read the comments, you see how crazy we are as a society, especially when it comes to Christian stuff. Uh, what a, what a, this guy, Russell Brand, is like a, he's an actor, a comedian, and now he's got this podcast and he's got a big mouth. And I've been watching him go through this spiritual transformation. And so this past week, he's, he decided he wants to get baptized. He's going to give his life to the Lord. He's been trying everything out, Buddha, everything. And, and so he's like, I'm going to get baptized. And all these people start telling him what he needs to do and just saying this and that. Make sure you get baptized at a Baptist church. You know, not Catholics, they watch it. You know, all this stuff. And all these experts. And it's knowledge without action. They're just, it's, it's just this so much pride. But if you're not on social media, again, you're blessed by God. 
The second problem is this, is action without knowledge. Action without knowledge. The way that the Proverbs put this is zeal or enthusiasm without knowledge. And it, the proverb says that zeal without knowledge leads to mistakes. And so I have a, so I've got like 10 images, but I only have time to share one. But immediately I think about this. In my boredom of not having any waves lately, wanting to surf, I've been like, i got to come up with another hobby. It's not going to be pickleball. It's not going to be this or that. I know pickleball is awesome. It's the new thing. You know, two years old to 80 years old, you can play pickleball. But I was like, what if I started playing golf? And so what if I started getting amped on golf? What if I started watching the golf channel, watch YouTube videos, watch the Masters, and envision myself being the guy? And just had all this enthusiasm to play golf and called up Mr. Wilson and said, hey, let's get a tee time at Landfall. I'm ready. I got the polo shirt on, the khaki pants tucked in. I bought the shoes. I, got, I went to play it against sports, bought the clubs. I'm ready to crush Landfall. So many bad things would happen. One, I'd frustrate Mr. Wilson. I would go and slow down the whole flow of the whole course for the whole day because I'd be out there hacking it up. I would be damaging the course, and I would probably hit somebody with a ball. It would just be a disaster. But I had enthusiasm. I had zeal. I had passion for the game of golf without knowledge. This is what we do when we just charge head forward you know, just fly ahead with all of our energy and excitement without biblical knowledge. And, and in Christianity, what it does, it can lead to accidentally hurting others. It can lead to false teaching and legalism and abuse of grace and all these things. It can even lead to being in a cult because you don't have any knowledge. You just have enthusiasm want to be a part of the thing. And so it's very dangerous and so those are two things, knowledge without action and action without knowledge. James today, in the scriptures we're looking at, shows us a better way. And that better way is listening to the Word of God and practicing it in our daily life. Listening, hearing the Word of God, studying the Word of God, knowing the Word of God, and then putting it into practice in our daily life. That's what today is all about. So let's jump in. James chapter 1, verse 19 through 20 says, Know this, my beloved brothers and sisters, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to get angry. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. In the message translation, it says, Lead with your ears. Follow up with your tongue and let anger straggle along in the rear. God's righteousness does, doesn't grow from human anger. And so the context of this is important, understanding like what, what was James addressing here? For us to understand how to apply the Word of God in this situation, we need to understand what was James talking about here. And so I, what I do to prepare, I read a bunch of different commentaries, a bunch of different study notes. I look into this from other people's perspective, these scholars who spend their lives studying the Word. And so the, the really smart uh, scholars, the, the, the ones who are, you know, anyways, doesn't matter. The, really, the ones who really uh, value education, they're like, this being slow to listen or quick to listen, slow to speak, it's slow to get angry. This is talking about Bible study. This is talking about Bible study. And then many, and many other scholars are like, no, 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 this is talking about life. This is talking about life. And so as I'm looking at all this, I'm like, let's look at the context of the passage. This is talking about getting along with others. This is talking about living your life in unity with other people. And the reason you do Bible study is so that you can be transformed by it and live like Jesus in the midst of people. And so being quick to listen, slow to speak, it's slower to get angry. It's not just about Bible study. It's about learning how to live our lives in unity. And so I think that's what he's addressing here. Because if you look at the whole book of James, it's all about practical living. And so we get into this knowing that, that he's speaking to a group of people, trying to help them live their life. And so he says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. And so I think 
the order of what he's saying is so important. The order of that makes so much sense. And here's why. I want you to imagine. I want you to imagine a situation where you have been caught off guard by someone's words or their actions. And this should be pretty simple. These are the micro moments of life. They happen so fast. Maybe it's your roommate. They're like, whose dishes are these? Who's going to clean these up? You're like, I always did the dishes. You know, whatever it is. Maybe it's your spouse who you're locked in for life with as a roommate. Maybe their tone of voice is off or whatever. They say something insensitive in in their tiredness. Maybe it's a coworker that highly annoys you that came in hot. Maybe it's your, ch- your child or children have been arguing about the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over. You have no more patience. Imagine the moment and, and where you've been caught off guard. And so if you do the opposite of what James is saying, if in that moment you're quick to become angry. You feel the energy of angry because anger is like an energy. You feel it go up through your body. You're ready to take action. It actually drives you to action. But here's the problem with anger. When you are angry, you can't think clearly. It actually inhibits your ability to think clearly. And this leads to an abundance of words usually. And usually when you're hot and you're angry, it leads to an abundance of emotionally charged words. Are you, are you tracking on this? Can anybody relate? You don't have to raise your hand. Just give me a subtle nod. And so then when you're in these emotionally charged words and there's an abundance, it suppresses your ability to hear. You're not listening anymore. You can't hear because you're saying so many words. I practiced this one yesterday. It's just horrible. So you can't hear, and then what happens is like throwing fuel on the fire, and you make the conflict worse by doing the opposite of what James says. So let me just ask you to think about this. Can you think of a situation, take one of the situations you already thought about, and did responding with quick anger, lots of emotionally charged words, and not listening at all, did that actually help and resolve the situation? You Has it ever? No, it's obvious. This order is so important. I can guarantee you, I look back on my life and I think about whether it was parenting situations or marriage communication issues or roommate situations back in the day or coworker situations, Being fired up in anger always led to an overreaction. Always. James is telling us the truth here. So let's look at the order he suggests. You got that situation, you're caught off guard, you're like, oof, and you have a a split-second moment to react. If you're quick to listen, you have a better chance of understanding the situation before you react. You're listening. What is this person saying? What is this person doing? And so you're you're listening. You're trying to pay attention. You're trying to understand. And then you have a better chance of responding with helpful words or actions. That sounds so nice on paper. Like if somebody just offends you, that's the last thing in your mind. How could I help? It's like, how can I not do something stupid? But if you listen, you're better off responding appropriately. And then when you do this, like Proverbs 16, 1 says, it it, it says a gentle response diffuses anger. That sounds like you're diffusing a bomb. Think about when your spouse is fired up. You have a split-second choice of I can throw a fire on the flame because they're annoying and I'm offended, or I can diffuse the bomb here with a gentle response. We have, all those, we have so many micro moments throughout the day like that. But when you actually do this, it cools and diffuses anger. 
and it keeps anger in its place. See, anger is not bad. Unrighteous anger, uncontrolled anger is like a tsunami that just has no boundaries. Anger that is appropriate, you know, geared at injustice, is like a river where it's channeled and it can do lots of helpful things. But remember, he doesn't say, he says, quick to listen, slow to speak. He doesn't say don't speak. He says slow to speak. He doesn't say shut down in anger. He says slow to speak. Watch your words. And then he says slow to anger. Not don't get angry, but make sure your anger is going to help the situation. You know what the scariest thing is? Somebody who has measured anger over a long period of time they will change the world. Rather than a flashbang where somebody has a temper tantrum, says a bunch of unhelpful things where they have to go back and undo, and then they forgot why they were angry in the first place because it was a rage of adrenaline. It died, and they just need to go take a nap. Rather than someone who is, how can I direct traffic over the course of hours, days, weeks, and years? That's what it's going for your slow to anger. And then you actually have a better chance of resolving situations. I mean, this is the stuff of life. How many interactions do we have with people throughout the day? We have so many opportunities to know this and practice it. But this is what James is saying. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry because human anger doesn't produce the righteousness of God. And test it. In your experience, has has being quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry, helped or hurt? It's obvious. We know the truth of this. And so imagine how much better your life and your relationships would be if you started putting this into practice. Because I'll tell you this, we all do this. It's like the temptation is to go, you know, if, if my spouse was different, I wouldn't have a problem with these words. If my roommates were different, and the beauty is you can get new roommates. It's not good to get a new spouse. If my coworkers, if I didn't have to work with that person, life would be better. And we want to control our environment rather than allowing the word of God to transform us. But imagine how your life would be better if you started allowing God to change you through putting this into practice. Because you know what he's doing? He's trying to make you more like Jesus. Because Jesus is the ultimate model of being quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. He's the perfect model. And if you read the Gospels, you see how that plays out. But so full transparency, I just want you to know, I like to be a man of integrity. And so I'm not good at this at all. I'm not good at this at all. I'm good at a lot of things. I will show up. I will get it done. I will follow through. I can take pain over a long period of time. I can be punched in the head multiple times and get back up. But I'm not good at this. I am not good at this. I'm more like I was thinking about it trying to rate myself because the Bible says you need to be self-aware. So I was like, I think I'm like two out of every 10 situations I do this. Two out of 10. But the good news is this. I'm trying to put it into practice. And so this year I want to get to three out of 10. By God's grace and his work in me as I practice his work, next year will be four out of 10. And the same is true for you that God is working in your life and is transforming you slowly, but you have to practice. And so what part of practice means for the other seven or eight times you don't do it, you have to go back and clean it up and you go, hey, I didn't do the standard. You were highly annoying. You don't say that part. You think that. It was very difficult to do this, but I blew it. I blew the standard. And so I apologize. My goal is this not just controlling you. My goal is to be quick, to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry no matter if chaos is going on around me. I'm not trying to control my environment. God wants us to do what we can do, which involves allowing him to change us through obedience. Amen?
So James in the next verse gives us the real deep solution about how to become a good listener. But I do because I'm a struggler at this and I can openly admit that. There are some really quick practical things that will help. And then we're going to get to the real solution. But the practical things are this. For those who struggle with anger, take a quick, deep breath. You do three or four of those, you feel your heart rate go down. So you get hit with something, you do that. Me and Oliver do this all the time. Rather than tackling each other. It's like, it works. Three or four of those will solve your anger. You can actually think. And then two things for listening is don't interrupt, because if you're talking, you can't hear. If you're talking, you can't hear. But then don't do this. Don't just be quiet and be thinking about your response. That one's fun. Like, I don't like anything you're saying. I think you're stupid, but I'm going to think about my response because what I got to say is real important. And the, the things I just said, nobody, nobody says that out loud. But that's what we do. If you're not listening to somebody, you don't respect them. And so you're just thinking about how am I going to respond? You need to hear what I'm going to say because I'm right. And so don't think about your response. Take deep breaths. Don't interrupt. Don't think about your response when somebody's talking. And then here's a really important one. Ask clarifying questions. Because you know what's crazy? When you start ask clarifying questions, you realize how nobody listens to each other. You just, you, you, you just, somebody just talked for 10 minutes, and so you say something like, so what you're saying is this. And they're like, no, that's not what I said at all. And you're like, so then you got to ask another one. And sometimes it takes two or three times to get to what they actually were trying to communicate. And if you feel like someone's not listening to you, you say, hey, could you tell me what I just said just so we're on the same page? And you might say, Brian, this doesn't sound very spiritual. This sounds like, this sounds like um, self-improvement. It's called wisdom. And if you want to grow in becoming a listener, if you want to have a better marriage, you want to have better friendships, you want to do better at work, you better learn how to do these practical tips. All right, let's get back to the Word of God to go under the hood. So how does James tell us to become, how to become a kind of person who listens well, who uses their words wisely? How do we become a person who is slow to anger, like Jesus? What does he say? He says, you got to do two things. Put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with humility or meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. That's the power. And so he says two things. The first step is you have to put away filth and evil behavior from your life. Things like, Paul, if you don't know what that he's talking about there, go to Colossians, Galatians, Ephesians. Peter talks about them. There's, they make lists of what he, they would consider filthy, ungodly, evil behavior. And some of those lists include anger, lying, gossip, using harsh words, passive, aggressive ninja words. That's not in the Bible, but they hurt. Sexual sins, which are obvious, overindulging, and greed. He says, you got to get rid of them. Those are just a few. We, I think if you're really paying attention, you know what you need to do. But he says, to, to be able to become the kind of person that you want to become, to become like Jesus, you got to clear space out of the house. It's like if we were going to come to your house and go, hey, we're going to give you $20,000 to, to redecorate here. The first thing you got to do is clear out grandma's furniture. Clear out the hand-me-down stuff. Clear out all the old furniture. Because it would be kind of funny to get all this new, kind of well-thought-out, designed furniture and, and, and decoration idea and put it right in there with the old stuff. You got to clear out the filth and the ungodliness in your life to make room for what God wants to do in your life. This theme is throughout all the New Testament letters. Put off, Paul says, put off that behavior, 
put on the new behavior. Put off, put on, put off, put on. It's a pattern in Scripture. And so James is following that pattern here. The second thing he says is once you've cleaned it out, receive with humility the word of God, which is able to save your souls. It has the power. The word of God has the power to save your soul, not just save you for heaven one day, but actually to save your whole being today. Transform the person, but just take a moment because we, we um, I do this. You know, we get so used to hearing things like the word of God is powerful, but we take it for granted, I think. Like not only is the word of God true, and you can test that, like, Test the word and find where it's not true. Go throughout the whole Bible and say, show me where this is not true. It always proves itself. So not only is it true, not only when you read Jesus' vision and really the whole scripture, the vision, we'll call it the vision of the word of God, God's vision for what human flourishing looks like. Because we all want to flourish. We all are trying to, we call it the good life. What is the good life? We have a vision for the good life. The scriptures have a vision for human flourishing in the kingdom of God where Jesus is king ruling in justice. That's the vision. So not only is the word of God true, he says receive the word of God with humility. Not only is it a beautiful vision, the best vision for how to be in a friendship, for how to be in a marriage, for how to do your work and pursue your career, Jesus gives you days off. It's amazing. Not only is it the best vision, but it's not just a roadmap. It actually has power. The Bible says it's living and active. And it has the power. I think the power to save your soul is not just the gospel saving you from hell, which it is, but it's saving you from yourself on this earth, which is a, transforms your life into the image of Christ. Man, that's good. And so James says, hey, don't take this word of God for granted. Receive it with humility and allow God, the, I love the message says, allow God to landscape you like a garden and produce a beautiful, healthy garden in you, in your soul. And that's what the Word of God is capable of doing. So the question is obvious is, is do you know the Word of God? And this isn't like a gotcha question, because everybody in here is in different um levels of maturity in your faith. Some people in here are just searching. Everybody's at a different point of knowledge. Some people have been doing this a long time, and so they have they've know more of the Word than somebody who hasn't. So it's not about, you know, competing, but it's about everybody. We all, if, if the Word is true, if the Word has the best vision for human flourishing, and if it has the capacity and the power to change your life, we should know it. And so we should all have the same goal is we got to figure out this book. We got to know the word. We got to know the the story. We got to know what the different parts are. We got to know the overall message. We got to know some of the details. And so we got to read it. We got to study it. We got to memorize it and allow it to transform our lives. And so my question to you is, are you in a practice of reading it? studying it and memorizing it. And like we've made that such a churchy thing. It's like, oh, I did my quiet time. I read, I just skimmed it for 15 minutes. It's like, man, you don't respect the word of God if you're just like, check it off the list. Now I'm going to go do the real work of the day. Get these biceps looking good. Your wife doesn't even care about them. She just wants you to listen to her. Isn't that funny? Just take a sidebar. All the men in the gym staring in the mirror like, working on the most obscure muscles. Their wives don't even care. Or if they're not even married, they're like, I'm going to get so good. And when I get a wife, she's going to care. That she doesn't care that much. She cares a little bit. 
But if you get in the Word of God and you become the man like Jesus, you're going to be so attractive. Amen, Debbie. Like, that, they, she said it. She's wise. Young men, listen to her. You want to be sexy? Get in the Word and become a man of character. Get your butt out there and work. Do all the good things. Be gentle. Be a strong man that is gentle. Oh, we don't have time to get into the details, but that is the vision for human fl- flourish. It's amazing. So you got to know the Word of God. It's, it's, mm. all right, let's move on. James 1, 22 through 25. But be doers of the Word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the Word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. For if he looks at himself and goes away and at one forgets who he's, what he's like, but the one who looks into the perfect law of liberty and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So there's a mouthful there, but the point is, don't just listen to the words. You've got to listen to the words. You've got to hear the words. You've got to know the word for it to transform your life. But you also have to practice the word. And that's the theme of this passage. So the first thing he says is, don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, he says, you're only fooling yourself. You're deceiving yourself. You're deceiving yourself. So we don't, nobody wants to be deceived. Nobody wants to be a fool. The message says, don't fool yourself into thinking that you were a listener when you were anything but, letting the word go in one ear and out the other. Act on what you hear. And I like that image of looking at the mirror, staring in the mirror, and then you walk away and you're like, what? What do I look like? Just forget. That's what it's like when you read the Bible for 10 minutes in the morning, check it off the list, and then live your vision of human flourishing. You're like, man, why doesn't this work out the way I want it to? So then the second thing he says is, you must be a person who acts on what he hears. That is the person who is blessed. You must practice the word of God. This isn't about being perfect. This is about practice. It's about trying. It's about putting forth effort and trusting that God's going to work through your effort, and over the course of time, you're going to slowly develop into the goal. You're going to get better and better at what you're doing, better and better at practicing the Word. And I love that he says the person who practices is the one who is blessed by God. And we know it's true because God's Word always produces fruit in every area of your life. Like, this is where, like, I get fired up and I just, like, think about this from, from, a, from a, your human perspective. It's like, what does a flourishing life look like? It's, one, it's being healthy personally, you're mentally healthy, physically healthy, spiritually healthy, emotionally healthy. Then it's being you know, a lot for, for many people, not everybody, it's being in a, in a committed marriage relationship. You know, some people are going to be single and healthy, but if you're in a committed marriage relationship, it's actually enjoying that relationship. It's, it is hard, but it's developing a friendship and a lifelong commitment. And if for those who have family, not everybody's going to have family, but for those who do, it's being in a loving family you take care and you lead and you train and you, you discipline and do all the things and you provide. And you raise up this family for the purpose, not keeping them, but to send them out into the world. And then that takes having a career that produces an income and then you steward that income. And I mean, just you could go on and on and on about what a flourishing life is looks like, and the Bible says the one who applies the Word of God is blessed in that. It's not perfect, but he helps. And so you have to believe the Word of God. You have to apply the Word of God to be blessed. So the question, then this is 
Again, this isn't like my motive here isn't like gotcha. That's easy to do. But it's but I'm I'm here because I want to grow in Christ. I want to get to know God more and more. I want my life to flourish. And I've got so many problems that I have to bring them to God, and, and so do you. And so I want to be a community of people that leans into the word even when it's hard. And, and what I'm about to say is is hard. But we need it because how can we expect God to bless us if we're not doing what he says to do in the details of our life? And, and so a couple of questions to think about this here is how can you expect God to bless your relationship if you're sleeping together? And you're not in a committed marriage relationship when he said, this is the vision. This is the best way to do it. How can you be praying, God, bless this union when you're not approaching it his way with the most sacred form of intimacy that you have? I get it. It's hard. Everything in the world is telling you it's okay. But how can you expect God to bless that? How can you expect God to bless your marriage if you're not sleeping together? didn't see that one coming. And here's why I say it. Here's why I say it is because the the goal is not just sleeping together. Outside of health issues or age or some other, you know, real thing, intimacy and sleeping together, it's a representation and an indicator of emotional connection. Simpler way to say it, of your friendship of your connection with one another. So if you're not being in the most intimate form of your relationship, it's probably a signal that there's other things going on. And so you're like, God, bless me, God, bless me. But you're not doing the work of connecting with one another. And the lack of intimacy is like a warning light on the dash light. It's like, how many of us drive, just keep on driving with the check engine light? Oh, well, who cares? That's what we're doing. How can you expect God to bless your finances when you're not stewarding your money? How can you, ex- how can you pray, God, just give me more, just give me more. But when you're overspending on all these things, how can you sit there and go, God, bless my finances. We just need more. That's the answer but you're not managing what you have when the scripture is full of money, you know, words about money. Jesus, you know, it's funny, pastors get a hard time. Why do you always talk about money in church? Jesus talked about hell and money a lot. And so how can you expect for God's blessing and to be like, I got your back, I'm going to further this thing, I'm going to invest in this when you're not, you know, just applying the basics. How can you expect God to bless your work when you're not living in his vision for work? You never take a break. You never rest. You're not stewarding your time. You're being lazy. How can God bless it? But here's the good news. The flip side is as if you wake up, because the Bible tells us God's kindness leads us to repentance. When we hear hard teaching, so I just hit a bunch of like very common issues. And the, if we were in this room and nobody struggled with any of those things, you didn't hear your number called? We're probably in the wrong room. We're a bunch of strugglers. We need Jesus's help. Can I get an amen on that? We're not here because we're good. And so when you hear your number called, the, the response should be all just shame. It should be, Lord, I do this because I struggle with it. And I think it's better than your way. Help me to trust your way. Show me the first step to move in the right direction. You know, one another reason is I'm here is I secretly hope, not even secretly, publicly hope, that God would create a revival in our hearts and that every Sunday this place would get more stoked because we're growing in the Lord and we're seeing it. But that cannot happen. And corporate revival, corporate renewal begins with individual renewal. And so until you're individually stoked, the corporate thing will not happen. 
And so part of that is clearing out the ungodliness, and none of us are freaking perfect. It's the wrong church if you're here. But we all have things where we can constantly go, man, we've got to remove that thing. And for some, it's, it's, it's always different struggles. But is there something in your life where you want God to bless you, but you got this obvious thing in the way? Because here's the good news. God wants to bless you. The stuff I'm listening to is just in the way. There's one more part we'll go real quick. Because James is hitting hard today. He says, you think you're religious and do not bridle your tongue, you deceive yourself in your heart. The person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. And the message says, anyone who sets himself up as religious by talking a good game is self-deceived. And so what is pure and undefiled religion before God the Father I think, it, I think it literally is to help the orphans and widows, but I think that also represents anyone who cannot help themselves. And so helping people who cannot help themselves and keeping yourself unstained and uncorrupted by the world, that's a constant process. We constantly get pulled back in. Constantly get pulled back in. So two questions. Who are you helping that you cannot help them help themselves? I know it's hard because our lives are so se- segmented. Like everybody, for the most part, that lives around me is very wealthy. And it's like, man, there's not too many people who are struggling around me, maybe in different ways. And so you have to be creative to go out and find people. And so you can work with organizations, and that's what we do as a church. But who are you helping that cannot help themselves? Second question is, are there any areas in your life that you have been corrupted by the world? The top three big ones are in forms of ego, sexual immorality, and greed and consumerism. Those are the ones that pull us so strong in our culture. Have you been corrupted by those three things or one of those things? And that's where you need to take it before God and lay it down at his feet. All for the purpose of of experiencing him more and growing in his character. And when we all take steps to do that, man, good things happen. Good things happen. So as we leave here today, if you had to self-evaluate, where are you on the ability to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry? How are you doing in that? How do you need God's help to grow in each one of those things? You know, where are you on knowing the word of God. We have so many resources. You know, how are you approaching that? Think of it as a marathon. If you wanted to, if you made a goal of over the next 10 years, I'm going to get to know this book. What do you need to do to approach it that way? Because you don't have to figure it all out today. Who are the people around you that can help you? What are the resources online that can help you? Where are you with your knowledge of scripture and how to apply it to your life? And then where are you on applying the Word of God? What what is God speaking to you today when you heard that? What are the obvious things in your life that you're like, you know what, I've been ignoring this, but I need to start practicing the Word, the things I know, and start practicing that more. What are those things in your life? And then finally, are there any areas of your life that you have been obviously corrupted? that you need to bring before God and have a little mini revival with him. Lord, take this from me. Help me. And who in your life can you help that cannot help themselves?